Hello, good evening, and welcome to another episode of Star Book Talk. I'm Sara Anjumbari, editor of Daily Star Books, and today we're here to discuss a very special topic. Bangladesh, this land of revolution, of hope, perseverance, love, and often a lot of violence, turned 50 years old this year. And if anything does justice to telling its story, it is the literature that has been produced in this land. To honor that legacy, Professor Niaz Zaman, noted academic writer, translator, and curator of many significant volumes on Bangladeshi literature, has edited the latest anthology, The Demoness, The Best Bangladeshi Stories, um, published by India's Aleph Book Company. And on this week's print issue of the Daily Star Books, Professor Shamsad Mortiza reviewed this book for us. Shamta Sir is Professor of English and currently the acting VC of the University of Liberal Arts at Bangladesh. And it is with these two very notable figures from Bangladesh's literary and academic world that we will, we will be discussing our new book today. So without further ado, I would like to welcome my two guests, Niaz Ma'am and Shamta Sir. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm sure Shamsa sir has a lot of questions and discussion points to raise about the book with Niaz ma'am, but I would like to begin with you, Niaz ma'am, if you could tell us about um, how the idea of this book was conceived, and then Shamsa sir, if you could tell us about your very first reactions to the book as a reader when you took it on to review, re uh, review it for us, Niaz ma'am. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you for asking that question. Uh, initially, um, I, I, I was not approached. It was Shabnam Nadia who had been approached by someone mm -hmm. in Alif, and they wanted her to put together an anthology in their series, which is called the greatest uh, Bengali yeah. books ever <coughs> told, or the greatest um, uh, you know uh, Urdu books um, ever written. Um, and um, uh, Shabnam uh, suggested my name, so they approached me. And um, I told them, I said, you know, I'm not very happy with that, the title of that series. Because when, you know, how do you judge what are the greatest, you know, stories ever told in a particular language? Um, but I did not want to let go of this opportunity, especially when. Uh, I had uh, bought a copy of, uh, I think it's the, the greatest uh, Urdu stories ever told. And um, I saw that, um, uh, and I saw that they had stories there from India as well as Pakistan. Um, when we were talking about the greatest uh, Bangladeshi stories ever told, I told them that, you know, Bangladesh is not the name of a language. It is the name of a state, a nation state. And if you talk about Bangladeshi stories, there can be stories in English, there can be stories in Urdu, there can be stories in Bangla, there can be stories in Chakma. Um, so, you know, there was that problem with the title. And then, you know, they sent me um, um, Urunava Sinha's introduction to the greatest Bengali stories ever told. And that really upset me. And it upset me because whereas the, the greatest Urdu stories ever told included writers from Pakistan and India, the greatest Bengali stories ever told did not include a single writer from Bangladesh. And uh, so when, you know, we were continuing to talk and unfortunately, um, you know, the person with whom I started talking at Alif, Alif uh, she left, then someone else came. So I've been dealing with several people and, you know, it's not a very pleasant thing to have to deal with different people over the course of two years. Uh, so when I saw that, um, uh, you know, Sayyid Waliullah had been left out, for example, from the greatest uh, Bengali stories. I thought that I would uh, say yes, though I was not happy with the title. 
and I would include Sayyid Waliullah, and I would also include Kazi Nazrul Islam. And the reason why I included, I know Shamshad had a question, and maybe Shamshad will ask that question again, and I will answer it. And uh, Kazi Nazrul Islam uh, is the national, you know, the, um, he is our national poet. He did get Bangladeshi citizenship, and he did die and is buried in Bangladesh. It is true that um, you know, Nazrul fell silent in 1942. He didn't speak or write after that. Nevertheless, uh, I felt that um, he should and could be included, along with Sayyid Waliullah, who died in October 1971 without getting a Bangladeshi citizenship. But say, uh, Sayyid Waliullah is from Bangladesh. And Sayyid Waliullah in 1971, he worked for the Bangladesh cause. He also lost his job because he was working for the Bangladesh cause. So these are the two people, you know, that, you know, uh, you know, there has been a lot of criticism. People have asked me this question again and again, even with Sayyid Mujtaba Ali, you know, who did his writing much before. And um, so that is the background. And then Alif decided that since this is the 50th year, the anniversary of Bangladesh, they would uh, bring out this book to celebrate um, our golden anniversary. But, you know, the title is a misnomer uh, for two reasons. One is that if you look at the, you know, the demoness, it strikes and it's also in red. It jumps out at you. And unfortunately, it's not about a demoness. It's about a woman who, well, you know, she killed her husband. And of course, she justifies why she killed her husband. But, you know, the second part of the, the, the title, it's a title in two parts, tells us that these are the best Bangladeshi stories from 1971 to 2021. Now, the problem is that all these are not contemporary stories. They were not all written after 19, in 1971 and after. Many of them predate the creation of the state we know as Bangladesh. But the name Bangladesh preceded the state. And I'll go back to Nazrul Islam. And in one of his beautiful songs, he talked about, he used the term Bangladesh. And when, you know, we in, talked in Bangla about this part before the creation of Bangladesh, we called it Bangladesh, two words. And for a long time, it was spelt in two words until it became combined as Bangladesh. So that is the, you know, history, um, you know, the, the circumstances that led to this book. And um, I was going to keep, I, in fact, the, the translator, Zerin Alam, she's a professor of English at Dhaka University. She had kept the original title, Rakkushi. And Rakkush is a word which is quite common in India. Maybe, you know, um, uh, 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 an English speaking person doesn't know the word, but Rakkush is common in many parts of India. It is common in Bangladesh. And we have retained the term Rakkushi. But uh, the publishers, they wanted to give the English translation. So they gave it the demoness. They thought it would sell. Uh, they thought that if they said um, 1971 to 2021, the book is going to sell. And of course, a book is also a, a saleable product. So, you know, I can't argue with the publisher because I didn't spend a single pie on this uh, on this book. They are putting up all the money. They are spending the money. So if they think, you know, of course I did, I did have some things to say, and I did complain. I did protest, but finally I let them have their say because, after all, it is um, uh, Alif who are publishing it, and somehow, you know, the title "The Demoness" has caught people's eyes. But of course, all the stories are not about demonesses. <laughs> Thank you, Niyazma. Um, Shamsat, sir, if you could tell us about your first yeah. reactions to the book. 
Thank you so much. And uh, so ma'am actually explained. Uh, so you said like, you know, what was my first reaction? Uh, the reason I said yes, like, and even though there was a time constraint, you just gave me probably 72 hours to review the book and such a, you know, a huge book because I never say no to Nia's ma'am. You know, she's such a lovely person. Like, you know, I admire her a lot. And so she has done so much service to Bangla literature, you know, so uh, a good translator is hard to find. And so she's not only a translator, so she's translator's translator, you know, so she has, you know, created a pool of translators, like you know, guided them, like, you know, mentored them, you know, so in, including myself, like, you know, I worked uh, on her Nuzul project. So the reason I like, you know, readily agreed. So when you approached me, you know, so for the review, so yes, uh, that was a strong yes for me. But having picked up the book, so I was confused by the title, as Ma'am just explained. Uh, yes, it is a misnomer when you have, you know, one story representing the entire collection, and then you have a bracket, the temporal bracket from 1971 to 2021. So uh, is it a personal choice? I, I said, like, you know, it's probably Ma'am's personal choice, but uh, I can also see that, yes, it's a marketing gimmick. You know, for, for the publisher also, like, you know, it, it has to have a catchy title. So that's uh, there. And I was also impressed by the fact that, you know, just looking at the table of content itself. So the representation of female authors, like, you know, so 11 female writers, you know, so in midst of 27. And we have the same complaint about anthology making. So the politics of anthology making, right? So it is the editor who decides. And in most cases, the editors are male editors, right? So if you look at Northern Anthology, so maybe, you know, 4% or 5% would be female authors, you know, so 95% authors would be like, you know, male authors. So this is quite refreshing. So what Nias Mam has done, like, you know, so giving almost equal share to, you know, female authors, so that's amazing. And also like, you know, so there are some, you know, um, like non-mainstream authors. So she does not only like, you know, make sure that, okay, so Kazino uh, needs to be there, so the Mustafa Ali needs to be there. So the Waliyu needs to be there. So, you know, she also picked up someone like Shadu Zaman or Mushilala, you know, the experimental writer. So it's not only Sayyid Munzul Islam, but, you know, so I, I really like that fact. So the variety is very impressive. And so uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, going through the book. So some of these stories I've already read because, you know, they, they were already translated. And uh, at the same time, the introduction is uh, a gem, like, you know, so you get a proper uh, overview of Bangladeshi writing uh, scene. But I, I, I felt that ma'am could have explained a little bit about the translators and their style. You know, so uh, the introduction mostly focused on the plot because, you know, she was trying to explain the story for a global audience. Uh, but the translators have done you know such a wonderful job you know so and including her ma'am herself you know included some of the, uh, you know translated uh, quite a few of the stories so i i felt like you know so uh, people like you know uh, professor zarin alom or uh, shabnam nadia so they've done a wonderful job so they could have you know some you know recognition of their translation itself or the process of translation i was just going through ma'am's uh, of pieces like you know publishing the daily star like you know she talked about you know how difficult translation is yeah and uh, finding a good translator especially the tense shift you know so the finding the right equivalence you know finding the right culture equivalence the linguistic e equivalence and also like you know, in bangla like you know so we don't have auxiliary verb you know so and in the process like you know when you translate you're confused like you know whether you should go for a present tense or a past tense you know so and I, I know like, you know, this is a very difficult thing. Like, you know, when you are thinking of a global audience, so if you have a young translator, you know, who does not have the uh, cultural orientation of like, you know, so uh, Syed Mustafa Ali's wit and humor, or like, you know, Syed Wali Ullah's like, you know, this, you know, cosmopolitan exposure. So uh, as an editor, like, you know, you have to make sure that, you know, everything is polished and toned down and all that. So I think Ma'am has done a wonderful job. So that was one of the reasons, like, you know, um, and that, that was the first thing that, you know, appealed to me as an anthology. Thank, thank you, um, uh, Shamshad. Um, if I may just add, um, you are quite right. You, meant, you said something that many of the stories you've read before. In fact, 
um, out of the 27 stories, only five stories are new. And, um, you know, when Alif approached me, I said, you know, I said, I've been, um, uh, uh, you know, working with anthologies for decades now, especially for UPL, you know, selected short stories and contemporary short stories, then stories on 1971, Rizia Rahman stories, then Writers Inc. has brought out single author stories. So, and what I did was I was trying to pick out the best stories. So, um, as I said, um, I didn't try to have a completely new anthology because I had, um, um, you know, thought about these stories, collected these stories in the past, thought them excellent stories and put them, you see. So um, 20 out of the 27 stories, only five stories are new stories. So for those of you who have, you know, got the UPL publications, uh, the stories would be old. But why did I include these old stories? I'll tell you why. I have realized that our books, our books published in Bangladesh do not cross the border. They do not cross the border to Kolkata, except during the Kolkata Boi Mela. And I know a distributor who distributes uh, Indian books in Bangladesh and is supposed to distribute Bangladeshi books in India. A few years back when I was younger, I did approach him and say that, you know, you have been, um, uh, you know, distributing Indian books in Bangladesh. What about distributing some Bangladeshi books in India? You know, I found it absolutely impossible to get in touch with the man. Absolutely impossible. Books, as I said, do not cross the border. When people want to write on the partition of 1947, and they learn that I have a book on this, uh, on uh, uh, stories written in English, Bangla, and Urdu, they ask me, can you send us a copy of the book? In Pakistan, the first time Pakistani readers knew about 1971 in fiction was when Tahnima Anam wrote a book. And why? Because it was published abroad. UPL brought out a collection of stories. I'm very proud of it. 1971 and after. That book did not cross the border well. The border, not just to India, but you know, the um, uh, to Pakistan. It didn't go to Pakistan. I tried to be very clever. I got a, a Pakistani co-editor, and we put together stories from Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and also from America. And it was supposed to be a joint publication. Uh, UPL and Oxford University Press, Pakistan was supposed to bring it out for some reason. I mean, as I had decided that uh, she'd rather do a book on 1971 stories written by Pakistanis um, and not do this. So, you know, it's it's a struggle. If Bangladeshi books are, you know, there are, UPL is an excellent publisher. The books look good. Um, Bengal Publications brings out excellent books. Daily Star Books brings out excellent books. They are products, they are good, but they do not cross the border. But if uh, a bang like this, if a Bangladeshi author is published in India, then the Bangladeshi book comes back to Bangladesh, the book comes back to Bangladesh at a high price, I think it is 1500 taka a year, and, um, and then we buy it. So, you know, I, um, it's something that I love but it also makes me very sad. The politics of publication, the politics of distribution, the politics of marketing. And, um, you know, people in America know about the book. They can't get it. It's not available. It's $28 on Amazon and it's not available. So people are buying the Kindle, they are, you know, buying the Kindle version. But, but my translators, my writers in Dhaka, my translators in Dhaka, have not yet got a copy of the book. We can bl blame COVID for that because 
flights were closed. Um, and um, some, my, my young translator, Marzia, she's very good. She's also a writer. And uh, she couldn't wait for a complimentary copy. And she went to Bookworm and she got a copy for herself. So she is entitled to a free copy of the book. Yeah, but I, I totally subscribe to what you're saying. And I also mentioned uh, this hegemony uh, in my review. Because yes, you're very right that you know our books do not cross the border, and uh, there is a readership, but somehow that readership is being muted. Like you know, so the politics is there, and also like you know, the irony is uh, you were just saying that the greatest book collection from India representing Bangla literature. Now it's a shame because if you go to Kolkata, you don't hear Bangla anymore, right? So everybody's speaking either Hindi or English, you know. So Bangla is like you know, their third or fourth language, you know. And um, and if, if they become the you know representative or the ambassador of Bangla language, um, they look at our boy Mala like you know with pride and all that, and you know they all sigh saying that you know so we wish like you know we could have advanced Bangla to this level and all that. Uh, the pivot has shifted, you know. So the, the you know so the, the language is being actually exercised here in this part of the border. Uh, we use rhetoric to say that you know there is no border, but the reality is there is a border, and the real border is actually a mental one. You know, so it's a, you know, it's here, right here, uh, and uh, so the way out, of course, to use an overseas uh, platform, you know, to get published. Uh, some of our, because I, I know of my colleague like Shuman Rahman, like you know, he has been shortlisted for you know the Commonwealth. Uh, price, but that has to be again translated by an Indian translator, right? So without, like, you know, so we don't have penetration in the, you know, so literary market, you know, so without, like, you know, you know using someone from outside the border. And you are very right about, you know, Tamim Mahanam, like, you know, so for the first first time, like, you know, people are talking about 1971, and again. Uh, when you look at the text, the merit of the text, and you realize that you know, so our writers have told these stories of the middle class, you know, in such a vivid manner, and still, you know, it's not there out there. Like you know, we have not uh, done justice to our local writers. Uh, I think the language politics is is again to blame. Like you know, so we are not actually sure whether we should promote English at all or not. So uh, this is again, like you know, something that we struggle within the English department, you know, so the people think that, you know, we're trying to, you know, add to the colonization process by, you know, so trying to promote English language. But as you rightly quoted uh, Sir Manzul Islam regarding, you know, Tagore, like, you know, so we would not have got any Nobel Prize if there was no translation of Tagore. So similarly, like, you know, if you really want to be uh, there out there in the global market, make your presence felt, so you need to be translated. So, ma'am, you have been to like you know, so Sweden. I'm sure, like you know, if you go to the Swedish Academy, so outside the Swedish Academy, where the Nobel Prize is given, so within like you know, two weeks of any publication, they will translate a book. Right. So, if you really want to be like you know, part of the academy, so uh, the urgency is there. So, I think we need to be a bit more aggressive. You know, so we have the like the Bangabundu Center in Kolkata, like you know, so they should be promoting local authors. They should be promoting more translation because uh, India is not only about Bangla language. So there are so many regional languages. So people from like you know uh, South India would like to read Bangla literature, and the only way you can make it available is in English, right? So uh, I, I think this is an issue. Like you know, so we need to have a stock taking of our objective, what we really want. So do we really want to uh, celebrate Bangla within our border? Or, you know, so do we really plan to go abroad? And, of, uh, and at the same time, the expat community, right? So we have a huge diasporic community, so the second generation. So they would like to read Bangla literature in English, you know? So uh, I think so there should be more translation done. And I just took up the responsibility of Bengal Lights books uh, from ELAB I have been assigned. And I was just looking at their marketing policy, and I realized that you know, so we need to go into Kindle version. We need to go into digitized version, right? So relying heavily on mainstream publishing houses maybe is not the way out. 
uh, there has to be more uh, digital marketing and online promotion. And we need to create our own team to do that. We cannot rely on uh, outsiders to do it for us all the time. So I think marketing plays a really big role here as well, because um, this is something that I noticed when the Demoness came out. These days, when a book is published, social media is, of course, the best um, mirror, so to speak, to judge whether the book is doing well. And in the West, when a new book comes out, and if it's critically acclaimed, you will see that book cover everywhere in all social media profiles and all book, uh, book blogger profiles. And for many years, I hadn't seen any such Bangla book published in Bangladesh. But The Demoness was a book cover that I saw everywhere within the first week of its release in India. And so it just, I think about this a lot, you know, if, if we could have similar marketing strategies in Bangladesh where every person or most people interested in reading books will know that this book is released, whether you want to buy it or not, that comes later. Um, Shamsa, sir, yeah, I think you uh, had a few can, more questions. Can I just sir? add to that, Meghna? So uh, I don't know whether this is going to be controversial or not. Even essential takeover, you know, so focus are like, you know, published with, with a, in a co-editor and it has no market, like, you know, zero market in India. So they do not want anyone outside of that, you know, West Bengal, you know, cohort to translate Tigo. Right? So it's a shame, like, you know, so you have a book coming out of Harvard and still it cannot penetrate Indian market. Right. And uh, I, I, th I think Nias Mem will bear me out. Like, you know, so uh, there's a huge politics. So, and of course, uh, we're walking the walk and talking the talk. And it will take time to learn the rules of the game. But uh, Nias Mem is a pioneer. And uh, I'm sure, like, you know, so the next generation, like, you know, so Sarah, your generation. So you are actually, like, you know, well versed and you're like, plugged into the, you know, lived experience of the real world. And I, I, I am. Hopeful, like you know, the next generation, so uh, they will make a difference, right? Because who are tech savvy, like you know, who know how things work. Because um, senior professors like us, we still have a very traditional mindset. You know, so we think that okay, just doing a good work, you know, making sure that you know, it's, it's, uh, faultless. That, that, that's like an our responsibility. But you know, we never thought it in terms of marketing, I suppose, right? So if you have a good book published from Dhaka University Press, I don't think like you know, anyone has ever seen any book, you know, out of Dhaka University Press. Like you know, think of the edgy stock book, right? So it was lying there, and so Kaiser had to like you know rediscover it. Okay, so it's a shame. Like you know, so you have all these literary gems, you know, so almost like desert roses. That there is no one to like you know appreciate them. If I mean, you want to add just something? add to what Shamshad said, um, not only that, you know, example, uh, the Bangla Academy, uh, the Bangla Academy has been doing wonderful, wonderful work. Uh, most of its publications uh, are in Bangla, but they also have some excellent publications in English. But Bangla Academy has a policy that the only way you can buy a Bangla Academy book is by going to the Bangla Academy premises or in Kolkata going to the Boi Mela. You know, our the Bangla Academy dictionary, I think, was the best selling item in the uh, you know, Kolkata Boi Mela. But it's not available in the shops. The same thing is true about the Nazrul Institute. If you want a book, uh, Nazrul you know the, the the books are very low cost the the, the you know the, the paper is very ordinary um, but they are doing a good job they also bring out a journal but where can you get Nazrul Institute books only inside Nazrul Institute so you know these are two um, places which are publishing and no one knows about them you know because they are, you know, sort of like closed. And as Mushamshad said, uh, it's enough to publish. You know, at the end of the year, they will have the meeting and say, okay, we publish so many books, so many books in English, so many books in Bangla, uh, full stop. Uh, but, it, but it, uh, you know, someone was trying to do some research on Nazrul. 
uh, and I had to send her a copy of the book because it was not available anywhere in India. This was um, Muhammad Nurul Huda's book, you know, um, which is an excellent book, which is uh, which was volume one, volume two never came out. So we, we do have certain problems. And um, uh, this, this is a digression, but let me just tell you something. Before Humayun Ahmad became so popular, I was doing some research and I was looking for uh, Bangladeshi writers who had written on the partition. And I went to the bookstores in Newmarket and I asked for these books by name. And uh, they kept saying that, why do you want to read Abu Rushd? Why do you want to read Alauddin Al Azad? And they would give me a book from India. I said, no, Indian boy Ache. I have got the book I want. I'm reading Srinil Gangapadha's book. But I want these books from Bangladesh. They were not available in the bookstores. And another sad thing I will say, and I have to say this to you. I, I know this is not the forum, but you know, if you want to do research on you know, Bangladeshi authors, on East Bengali authors, you will think that you can go to the Bangla Academy and you will get books. No. The books are not available there, even in the library. I had this very sad experience because I was looking for some books by Leila Samad. You might have heard of her. She was, you know, a very progressive woman. Um, and I was looking for some of her books. Uh, the books were not there. Now, if Bangla Academy does not preserve these books, like if you go to the Library of Congress, and they have a policy that every, you know, they, every book published is there. They buy books from Bangladesh. It's there, you know, but unfortunately, um, and of course you can say that, well, we can go digital and everything will be digitized, but, but until it is, if the, the physical book does not exist, how are you going to digitize it? No. Yeah, and also our national library is not doing a good job with it because if you go to the national library, like, you know, so many of the pages are missing so they're not well preserved and of course like you know the reading atmosphere is not there like you know so yeah um, i i you know you need to like you know, i i know this is a digression so maybe we should go back to the book demoness but uh, yes but, yeah so sarah over to you no, that was a very valuable discussion, which I know for a fact many of our viewers will appreciate uh Shamshad, sir, you had some questions about the book would you like to start with that yeah, so ma'am, I'm just curious about your selection process. Like, you know, you just had to select maybe 27 stories. So what prompted you to pick these particular 27 authors, if I may add? And also, like, you know, when you were uh, selecting these authors, uh, did you think in terms of the uh, themes that they were representing or just the chronological names? Like, you know, uh, there are some authors, like, you know, who are environmentally driven. So there are uh, some... Uh, human relationship, you know, um, uh, some of them involve like, you know, love triangle or uh, one major themes that came across was public punishment. And I was very curious, like, you know, why do you think public punishment is such a big thing for writers writing in the 60s and 70s? You know, so, you know, it's a loaded question, but yeah. No, I know. Okay. I don't know if I can answer that. Um, well, when I was um, selecting, you know, I had a, I, I, well, I ha somewhere I have a diary where I wrote down the names of all the authors who I thought should be contained in the book. All the, the famous authors, uh, the, the Bengali authors, the Bangladeshi authors. And uh, originally, actually, Kazi Nazrul Islam was not there. I'll tell you the truth. Originally, I began with Sayyid Waliullah. I did not begin with Rukia Sakawat Hussain because um, uh, my intention was to include only books that had uh, only stories that had initially been written in Bangla. Okay? So that uh, uh, made me leave out Rukia Sakawat Hussain. So I began with Sayyid Waliullah. And uh, Kazi Nazrul Islam was, in a way, an afterthought. I brought him in when I realized 
that um, uh, he is not known as a fiction writer, but um, he is known as a poet, he is known as a lyricist, he is known as a journalist, he is known as an orator, uh, but he is not known as a fiction writer. And, uh, you know, Shamshad, you know, Shamshad has translated one of um, Nazrul's stories. It's a, it's almost a poem and it is about rain and it is about love. But there is, you know, a very, um, a, a tinge of Bengali racism in it. You know, the girl is dark and she tells her lover, how can you love me? I am so dark. Now that is a social question that is a social issue in um, you know Nasrul, you know he wrote love poems he wrote all sorts of poems he wrote poems about uh, socialism but in you know in his stories in his um, uh, novel bandhanara um, even in Mit mittu khuda you know he takes the woman's viewpoint um, many people can read bandhanara and say oh you know, there's this character, Nuru, who is a soldier. He is based on Qazi Nazrul Islam. So he must be the hero and let us read his story. But no, the women in Bandonara are much more important. And that a young man, he was very young when he wrote this novel, that a young man could enter a woman's mind, that a young man could enter a woman's soul. And the things this woman says, you know, for example, she says, I don't think that just because we are in Parda, we don't fall in love. That's what one woman says. Another woman says that before I die, you know, women are not supposed to be exposed. Hindu women of the upper class, Muslim women of the upper class were not supposed to go out in the sun, lest the, their skin darken. And this, there's a young woman in this novel who says, before I die, I want to breathe the fresh air. Now that a young man could empathize with a woman you know, and, the, and the creative mind is endogenous. So the creative mind, whether it's a woman writing or a man writing, the creative mind should be able to feel what someone else can feel. So I thought that, no, as I said, Kazri Nazrul Islam was an afterthought. And I looked at his stories and I thought I would take a story where he talked about a woman who was a murderess and make her a sympathetic character. So that is why I chose Nazrul Islam's story. Now, Murtuzai, uh, Sham Shamshad, you're so right that, you know, writers like Alauddin Al-Azad, uh, Sayyid Shamsullah, people, who, uh, writers were writing in the 60s and they were mainly male writers who came to the fore. They were very socially conscious writers. So some of my choice was also based on what sort of stories did these people write at the time. Now, Hasnat Abdullahi's story, now Hasnat Abdullahi is quite an elderly writer. But the story that I have chosen of his is a fairly recent story. It is a story that was written after uh, the Shabag uprising, and it created a lot of controversy. Prothom Alo published it and then withdrew it from its online version. And it, it, it aroused a lot of controversy. And uh, I took that story and um, I read it. And yes, it is a beautiful story by an elderly man. Usually we think, you know, these old men, they don't think about women. You know, they don't, uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, um, they look down on women who wear jeans and who shout too much. But when I read the story, I was amazed at how Hasnat Abdul Hai portrayed this young woman. A woman from, and it is so realistic. Mm. She comes from the Mufassil. She comes to study. The only way she can survive in Dhaka is by belonging, you know, by kowtowing to the political strong people. She is not a bad girl. Not once in the story 
does Hasna Abdul Hai make you feel that this woman should be condemned? And there is, a, you know, that she tells her story to this uh, person, this elderly person. And the nice thing is, is that he helps her. And that the, that the story ends with this beautiful scene with her in front of the TV camera, but now she is not an object of the camera. She yeah. is, uh, you know, reporting and she is talking about the uh, the, the, the Mongol Jatra, Shobha Jatra on Poyla Bushak. And I thought it was such a beautiful ending, such a realistic story and such a beautiful ending. I will also say here that sometimes I could not choose the story I thought was the writer's best. For example, uh, Hassan Azizul Haq story, you know, Attoja um, Arakti um, Korobi Gach, the daughter and the oleander, has been translated by Kalpana Bantan, beautifully translated. But the copyright of that story is with the California University Press. And they wanted a lot of money to allow the story to be used. So, so sometimes, because of copyright, one cannot include the story one wants to. But uh, I would say that the other stories that I chose, yeah. I chose because I wanted them to be included. Now, you know, Shamshad said, little known writers, for example, Jahanara Noshin. I might never have come across Jahanara Noshin. No one knows about Jahanara Noshin. She has won a few awards. She has not won the Bangla Academy Award. She has not won the Ekushe Padam. Mm -hmm. How did I come to know Jana Ranoshin? Because I belong to a certain, a small group of women writers. And we used to meet at EMK Center. Her house was in Lal Matra, just across the road. And she heard about us and she, would jo she joined our meetings. And I found her a lovely person. And then I started reading her stories. And I can, of course, tell you who she is. She is the sister of Hassan Azizullah. And she writes, you know, she writes very consciously as a writer. Sometimes she writes as a woman talking about women who have been wronged and continue to be wronged. But she can also write the funniest story, the funniest love story ever written, which I didn't include in this book. But um, the woman who ate cooking pots, mm. and it's a literal translation of the Bangla, you know, um, uh, you know, Harikawa. Um, and it, it's a short, it's a, it's a fairly short story. And it is, it is um, a, a young girl listening to her aunt telling the story of a woman who was killed by her mother-in-law because she picked up a piece of chicken from the dekchi while it was cooking. And you know she couldn't either spit it out nor swallow it. And the mother-in-law pushed it down the throat. It is a terrible story, but it is a very realistic story. Now, Jahanara Noshin, as I said, is not well known. But I thought that she needs to be known. Aditi Falguni is the youngest writer here. And uh, I included her story because it is also a, it's it's a very ambitious story it is. because it is about dwarves and it is about you know the plight of you know what happened in in in, in during the world war you know how these white um, soldiers came and what they did and what happened to the women who were left behind so it's a story of many layers and i thought that that story should be included there are many writers that i left out uh, many writers, famous writers, uh, for example, I'm very fond of Madhula Manzuz, the late Madhula Manzuz writing. You know, I thought, uh, you know, I, th I think she's a very good writer. But as I said, I wanted to, you know, I was given a limit. I crossed the limit. They didn't say 27 stories. I think they said 250 pages. But, you know, I eliminated a lot of the writers. And by elimination, I came to these 27 stories. Sayyid Mujtabali, I had not... Um, I had heard about, I had not read him, I, had, I kept on hearing about him. And then I decided that no, this time I am going to use a story by Sayyid Mujtabali 
He's a great writer. He's, and he's cosmopolitan. Oh, I mean, yes. He's the exact opposite of Nazrul Islam. He's a mm. cosmopolitan. He was a linguistic. He knew mm. many languages. He's a humorist. So, you know, my choice of stories, um, you know, I thought, as I said, I must give the big names. I must also include stories which I have enjoyed. Mm. I must include stories um, which um, which will leave an which have left an impression on me and hopefully will leave an impression on the reader. I hope that answered your question, Shamsha. Yes, thank you, ma'am. So Sarah, how are we doing in um, I had one work? question related to this topic, so I think I'll just bring it up right now. Uh, ma'am, you were talking about the definition, uh, what, what went into your definition of the best Bangladeshi stories and how you focused a lot on the writers that you admired. Um, but even though most of the stories were, all of the stories were translated from Bangla, there is a very diverse range of experiences and lives and backgrounds in the stories. It's not, um, it's, it doesn't marginalize this collection, in my opinion. Was this a conscious choice? Um, and could you tell us about the authors, like you said, that you did leave out of the collection because you had to? Um, no, if I talk about the writers I left out, I'll have to go back to my diary, you know, the writers. I, like I had to bring in Sayyid Manzur in Islam, okay? Because I think, you know, um, he's, he's a postmodern writer, you know, his style. Um, you know, like why did I choose Sayyid Manzur in Islam? I chose him because you know, he talks about, um, you know, he takes these little and sometimes he takes a very an almost insignificant incident and, um, uh, you know, turns it into a memorable story. Uh, he, he has surrealistic stories. Uh, the story I chose for this, this one, it's, it's a beautiful story and about how, um, you know, how uh, innocent people are um, unable to defend themselves. I, I thought that, you know, I, I think that Sayyid Manzur Islam is a brilliant writer. Uh, he's a brilliant writer. Um, uh, um, and now, uh, you know, they're like, who are the, the writers I left out? Um, I was thinking about uh, Madhbula Manzur, um, men whom I left out, um, are there men whom I left out? I just can't remember. I'm sure, of course, there are lots of men I left out. Men who are not going to speak to me. Uh, men who have bad-mouthed me on Facebook. I'm sorry to say. I am very sorry to say this. But I did have, I did have to limit myself. For example, I wanted to choose, as I said, two things. One is big names. I wanted people outside Bangladesh to know the names of some of our big writers. Now, I also wanted them to know about diverse topics that writers write about. For example, the story Pagli by Anwara Sayyad Haq. You know, Anwara Sayyad Haq is a psychiatrist. And she has written other stories. And I could have chosen other stories. I could have chosen a story where she talks about politics. I could have chosen a story where she talks about 1971. But I chose this story, which is about a mad woman. And it's such a common sight in Bangladesh. We have seen naked mad men on the road, naked mad women on the road. And what do we do? We get embarrassed. That's all that happens to us. And in this story, you know, there is such a, there is this man who is, he was sexually attracted to this mad woman in our country. Um, you know, they, well, things have changed. But, uh, you know, and, and nowadays, I think families accept um, their uh, sons and daughters having boyfriends and girlfriends. They accept that. But in a village, it's not that common. So this young man is attracted to this mad woman when she's, he sees her. But the mad woman, and there's such a wonderful twist at the end. This mad woman has just given birth. And when this man approaches her, you know, she thinks that he is her baby whom she has lost somewhere. And she brings him close to her breast in order to nurse him. 
So I thought it was a, a unique story, a very different type of story. Um, Shahad Zaman, you mentioned Shahad Zaman. Shahad Zaman writes very different stories, different different types of stories. This story, I was, um, I, I asked Sonia for a story, and she said she has translated his stories, and she suggested another story. But the reason I chose this story was because it, you know, mixed up um, folklore and reality, yeah. uh, you know, and and the foreign uh, researcher who comes to Bangladesh to learn about, um, you know, the rituals and the rites and the rhymes that surround childbirth. So mm -hmm. that was the reason why I chose Shahadu Saman's story. Um, I'm glad that you did, ma'am, because uh, the NGO image that you get, like, you know, so the, uh, you know, outside, like, you know, so all the NGO investment uh, that you get to see and uh, the folklore element. So this is the only story where you get, you know, the real rural Bangladesh, you know, yes. so represented through the rhyme, as you rightly said. Yes. 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 Yeah. But and, at the same time, uh, like, you know, the Auditi Falcon's story, like, and I was really, really, uh, I have not read that story before. Uh, but the dwarf idea, and you rightly said, the you know, it's very nuanced. So the white Americans coming in, the bastardization, and then eventually that girl, like, you know, becoming a model, you know, so the lip gel model and all that. So yes. the, the uh, research aspect of it, you know, so yes. uh, I, I, I felt that Shadu Zaman and Auditi Falgun, so they're like, you know, different uh, breeds of writer. So we're like an almost like Amitabh Ghosh kind of writing. So getting to the archaeology of things like an anthropology, cultural anthropology and writing and different kinds of writing. It's not like, you know, so uh, giving expression to one particular incident, you know. So did you feel exactly. that? Yes, exactly. 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 They're very, they are, you know, they are, you're, you're comparing him to Amitabh Ghosh. I didn't think about that, but you're quite right. And Odeti Palguni does do a lot of research, you know. Uh, there are other writers. Shahin Akhtar also does a lot of research for a novel, for example, um, Shoki Rangomala. You know, she she, she uses you know a, a palagan to write the story, and uh, uh, you know she, she, it's, it's it's researched. And um, uh, there are other writers who do research. You don't always see the research. For example, Rizia Rahman was also a writer who used to do research. The story that I have taken, of course does not show research. It is about 1971 and it is, you know, it's a, a, an, an ironic story because it tells us about how this girl was able to save herself from, you know, the hands of the Pakistani soldiers, but in an independent Bangladesh. And this was, you know, at the beginning or in the, in the 70s, just after liberation, we had a lot of problems. Some of you, are, uh, you weren't born then, Sarah. Um, but, you know, we who lived through that time, those were very difficult times. And she conveys that through the image of a young woman, um, you know, floating, you know, um, um, in, in the midst of a flood. And then she has this relationship. Uh, this little boy comes to give her something. But then when it comes to food, uh, how they fight and, you know, her sari is snatched away. And I thought, you know, there is such a lot of imagery there. You can see the flood, you can see the water, you can see the woman's sari floating away. And then, you know, she gets up naked and she says, um, I don't care. I am going to survive. And, you know, that is also um, the story which, um, you know, the story that I chose of Humayun Ahmad. Humayun Ahmad has got, you know, he was... A, you know, a very good writer until he started writing too much. You know, a writer can overwrite, but because he was in, in so much demand, his publisher kept on insisting more and more and more. But the story 1971, I think, is a classic. You know, this this uh, this Aziz master, uh, I think we've got five minutes left. Aziz master is a coward. You know, the villagers go to him. They think, you know, like Professor Shamsad Murtaza and Niazaman, we know everything that there is to know, but people don't know that we know nothing, that we are cowards. But, and then, you know, when he goes to the Pakistani military, the major, the major wants to insult him. And what does this man do? 
he uses his insult as his weapon, stands there naked, and the major has to walk away. I thought that was a brilliant story. So some of the stories here I chose because they were stories that made a lasting impression on me, and I wanted to include them. Maybe just a quick question, like because you have surveyed, uh, surveyed, you know, all these authors. What influence have you noticed? Like, you know, is there any Western influence, like you know, writers writing in the sixties and seventies, and when you come to the contemporary writers, you know, have you noticed any shift? You know, in kinds of like you know their orientation or exposure. <laughs> That's a very difficult question, Shamshad, because. Um, um, well, again, I will say, I, I, I know I did. I did. The reason I'm asking, for example, you know, the public uh, humiliation or punishment. So, you know, you notice like you know, uh, traces of scarlet letter in it. You know. Yes. So, this, yeah, so I was thinking, like, when you come to like you know, Amitabh Ghosh, as, as I was mentioning. So, has there been any shift in the uh, mental makeup of our authors in the last fifty years? <laughs> you know, Shamshad, that is a question I leave to researchers to find out. I, uh, you know, I think that the the, the writers that uh, Daedalus is kite, obviously. Daedalus is kite is obviously you have the influence, of, yeah, or, you know, of, you know, yeah. it's so obvious, right? Um, um, but um, I mean, I I didn't really see that, you know, um, you know. Um, again, I go back to Rizia Rahman. I said that Rizia Rahman, you know, she. Um, I think she was born in 1939, but she, you know, was a very serious writer. She had done her MA in economics. She was a very serious writer. And once she asked me this question, she said that does a writer have to know theory in order to write? I say no. A writer does not have to know theory in order to write. You know, people will write about you and they will use theory to discuss you, but you don't have to uh, no theory to write. But she was a person who did a lot of research. And um, there is a story called Irina's Picture, which is a beautiful story, which I've not, which Radha Chakravati translated and which I included somewhere else, where she does talk about, you know, um, you know, Russia. And then she has another story, again, which is not included here, where she has done research into Native American rituals. Um, Marxists, of course, they were all Marxists, um, you know, in the 60s. Um, they were all Marxists. They were all communists uh, until, you know, um, I don't know, until 1990. Uh, you don't hear about communism anymore. But they were all Marxists at that time. So yes, there was that influence. And um, of course, you can ask about um, Sayyid Waliullah and existentialism. The story I chose, the tale of a Tulsi plant, is not about existentialism. Though uh, another story that he has, um, uh, no enemy, uh, is a very existentialist story. You know, where this man goes to ask forgiveness from all the people that he has wronged. Uh, he is not thinking about punishment after death. He is not thinking about God. There is no God. I'm sorry to say in that story, you know, but he is asking for forgiveness for himself. Um, uh, Father Johannes, we see the influence of, uh, that is, um, you know, pre-partition about, it's about colonialism, about how, you know, the, the, the white man came with the Bible in one hand and rice in the other. And um, again, the servant, what the servant does, he has no weapon. What does he do? He has tuberculosis. Yeah. The only yeah. way he can you know, take revenge for all the humiliation is by spitting on the food and by infecting all of them. Okay, so thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Shamshad. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the, the good part is that uh, we did get a few audience questions in, but both of you answered all of those questions. I didn't have to bring them up. So um, <laughs> that's actually great. I'd like to end with one final question to both of you. Uh, we hear a lot of stories of struggles. For instance, one of my colleagues from the Star Books team was talking about how he's he's an aspiring writer, 
he wants to write for not only for Bangladesh, he writes in English, so not only for Bangladesh, but for the rest of the world. But um, we still ha face traces of colonialism. Um, creative writing programs, publishing houses, magazines will still tell us to have our stories checked by a first language for someone by someone who for whom english is the first language so what um advice would you have for aspiring writers um and for aspiring scholars of english literature who want to make it big in bangladesh and abroad you know nowadays there are so many platforms there are so many platforms and you write you write and you say you know the first story i wrote and sent to uh, well, not the first story one of the stories i wrote and I sent to a Bangladeshi newspaper, was rejected. It was rejected, thrown out. It was in the dustbin. And I'm glad it was thrown in the dustbin because then I sent it to Asia Week and it won an award. So, you know, there, you know, just be on the lookout. But the one thing that is very important is if you're a writer, you write, you continue to write. And nowadays, you know, you know, newspapers, for example, the Daily Star, the Dhaka Tribune. They are online. You publish a story in uh, the Daily Star. You publish a story in Dhaka Tribune. And I will say Dhaka Tribune because Dhaka Tribune has an excellent um, um, arts and letters magazine, which comes out once a month. You publish it there and it gets known. See, so that is a platform and people are picked up. And then, you know, go online, find out. Only problem is that, you know, if you want to enter a competition, they'll say $5 or $10. And, you know, we find it very difficult to do that. Yeah. But you write and you send and Indian publishers want, they, they'd be happy to publish, uh, you know, good stories from Bangladesh. They'll be happy to publish your stories and then send it to Bangladesh and, uh, to sell in Bangladesh. All right. Ma'am, I would like to add by saying that <clears throat> you need to find your own accent. So if you really want to be a Bangladeshi writer, so you need to have your own accent. If you just, um, you know, copy what uh, the creative writing cottage industry is doing. So you're not going anywhere. So IUB and ULAB, like, you know, so we are unique because we run, you know, creative writing workshops. And uh, we are in, at ULAB, we are the only university to offer a master's degree in creative writing. And when you have like, you know, people like, you know, Syed Mazul Islam or Professor Kaiser Hawk, and so you learn from the local masters, you know, so it does not have to be like, you know, uh, check uh, the first right, uh, the native speaker has to be there to make sure that you, you get the right accent or the right vocab. It's all about the cultural accent, you know, whether you get that right or not. And in terms of publishing, like, you know, so Six Seasons Review, like, you know, Bengal Lights Books, you yes. know, so, you know, so they're great international standard journals. Yes. Uh, and uh, at the same time, like, you know, so there are many uh, EGNs. You know, so like, you know, so if you go to like, you know, a magazine like Kitab in Singapore, you know, so they publish like, you know, very good stories. So I, I think there are, uh, as Ma'am was saying, that uh, new outlets that can be explored. But at the same time, what I like about like you know, Nia's Ma'am, like, you know, uh, she has uh, from IUB, I think, like, you know, a group of young writers and you have published your own book, right? So from Writers Inc., you know, so you can be a small press, you can bring out chap books, you know. So and then, like you know, once it is out there, you get feedback and you get known, and that's how you know you create your own niche. Yeah. No? I just so, one correction, Shamshad. The 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 uh, the, the book that um, the, the patchwork pages was, you know, a, a group of young writers who right. had a workshop, and um, Kesar was there. I was there, um, and um, writers in brought that out. But um, last semester, I took a creative writing course because Razia was not at IUB at the time. And the, right, the young people, they wrote so well, you know, um, mm. despite COVID, despite all the problems that I said, let us have a little, you know, chapbook. And we were going to just initially um, just print it out ourselves. And then the head of the department, Noreen, I thank Noreen Renama for that. She said, we have a little money. We can bring out a small publication. So we did bring out a small publication. You know, it's um, uh, stories. Uh, what is it? So one of I one know. of us has published a novel, like you know, so just Amazon, like you know, so and uh, she's bringing out a sequel to it. You know, so it's so popular, like an you know, online. 
So okay. there are new avenues. Like you know, this is yes. amazing. Like you know what the you know new generation is doing. So yes. I'm really really optimistic about yes. Uh, yes. our future. Um, and, uh, Niyazman, did you want to add something, I think? No, I was just going to add one thing. And that is, that there are young Bengali writers, writers who write in Bangla, who are writing excellent stories. Excellent stories. So you not leave that out. You know. Some of them are writing excellent stories. Imran, for example, writes in Bangla. Muzaffar in, at the Bangla Academy, he writes in Bangla. Their, their stories are excellent. And they are unique, you know, because you know, they, they, they have been doing a lot of reading. They do a lot of reading of in magic realism. You know, for them, it's not just the, the English writer or the American writer. You know, they, they read uh, Latin American writers as well. And they have been influenced by that. And they're writing wonderful stories in Bangla. But of course, to reach a, um, you know, an outside audience, those stories have to be translated into That's English. Good. Thank you so much, Sarah and Shamshad. Thank you to both of my speakers for making time for such a valuable and insightful conversation. Um, I hope you'll write for Daily Star Books. I hope I can have you back for another discussion very soon. Um, to our viewers, thank you for staying with us. Um, please pick up this book. It's, it's a great book. It's a very valuable book. Please read The Demoness. Um, if you want to read Shamta Sarah's book review, it was published in Daily Star Books this Thursday. You can find us find it on the Daily Star website. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And until next time, thank you. Please take care. Please stay safe. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very thank much. You. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Bye. Bye.